তাকে আপনি সভা ইয়ে পরিচালন করার জন্য তাকে ফার্স্ট স্পিকার হিসেবে ডক্টর হুমায়রা নাজনীন নি আপনার মতো করে মডারেশন আরম্ভ করেন ধন্যবাদ সবাইকে আসসালামু আলাইকুম ভেরি গুড মর্নিং টু অল উই অল আর গেদার হিয়ার ফর ওয়ান সিএমএল ডে টুডে ইজ ওয়ান সিএমএল ডে এন্ড মোটো অফ দিস ডে ইজ এ লাইফ উইদাউট সিএমএল অ্যাজ আদিসার হ্যাজ অলরেডি গিভ পারমিশন আই উইল রিকোয়েস্ট sorry for today's uh, cav uh, we have several panel of experts and uh, i uh, i would like to mention the name of the uh, chairperson of the scientific section we have the professor dr maska begum uh, professor of department of hematology dsmm among us and we have two distinguished speakers uh, first speaker is professor okiran bishesh sir professor and head department of hematology teaching medical college hospital and uh, our second professor is a very well known scholar dr professor dr matthews he is professor and head of department of hematology in cmc bellur then we have panel of experts we have four uh, three panel of experts among us first uh, one is professor a k m kamul jaman he is professor in department of hematology rangpur medical college hospital and another is uh, professor mohammad shia al islam sir uh, he is professor department of hematology sakoli mundha medical college hospital very much dr humaira nazrin uh, uh, i welcome everyone uh, to this uh, webinar uh, on the occasion of world cmel day uh, at first uh, i must uh, express my grief due uh, to the sad demise of father of one of my uh, guide and philosopher uh, So professor mahbub rahman hematology uh, president hematology society of bangladesh uh, then i am going to start my presentation actually i have made a bit uh, a bit change in my headline of the <coughs> presentation selection of tkis first line therapy in chronic face cml it is uh, why it is the uh, presentation of chart because we know that, that there are at least uh, five or six tki in the uh, field of treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia and it is really a time to say which with which tki you should start the treatment because we know that all the tki have the significant efficacy for treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia more or less and it is a it is a state of art to sequence the use of tki but probably with one tki we cannot complete the treatment of all the cml patient because some point of time we may have to change the tki sequentially so we have to choose the tki first line is very smart and we should make it evidence based and objective of the cml treatment what is the we know that all the cml is actually in a, a not a aggressive disease but once upon a time it had progressed to some accelerated last transformation and who is uh, absolutely fatal and so objective of treatment is always to to minimize the risk of progression of the disease so, so to prevent the progression from chronic phase to accelerated phase and blastic phase of the cml hence to achieve oral survival at present similar to that of normal population so that goal of objective of the treatment is making the people long in the pre tki era only hemopoietic stem cell transplantation was the almost only way to achieve that objective and we know that 
all people are not going to get the matched uh, donor and it is not hazard free so it was not a very good way before the ticket and all of the therapy to achieve that objective by which we can achieve the uh, survival goal uh, to achieve uh, major molecular remission or bcr abl ratio in international scale less than 0.1 uh, who is keep the chance of disease progression away because so we follow the patient and to achieve deeper molecular remission uh, like complete molecular remission who, that means bcr abl ratio less than 0.01 or MR 4.5 in terms of BCR even ratio less than 0.0032. The objective of the goal of major molecular, uh, deeper molecular remission is that to keep the chance of disease progression farther away because with deeper molecular remission, we become more confident that the chance of progression is minimum. And another important goal is to achieve the treatment free remission. Uh, Dr. Matthews will uh, talk on this matter in later on. An agent having cytogenetic and molecular effect. That means our target is to get the molecular or cytogenetic effect and which agent can give us that. That chemotherapeutic agent are not going to give that. The interferon alpha can give the cytogenetic effect and then TKI, the magic drugs, uh, first generation TKI zimatinib, second generation dasatinib, milotinib and bosutinib, another is radotinib. I am not mentioning here, but later on third generation is ponatinib. And specifically targeting a BL myristyl pocket inhibitor like a simini, and homocytexin. And the interferon alpha is almost obsolete in the uh, TKI era and probably uh, by that uh, 2022 interferon alpha is going to be omitted from the market for the treatment of CML. And within T and next, uh, ponartinib is not good for the first line and TMNIB is under discussion for the subsequent treatment is needed to Fail multiple only. And this is another second generation only up and won't be discussed here. And determinants of the selection of TKI is uh, efficacy like cytogenetic response, uh, molecular response, progression free survival, and ultimately overall survival and ultimate goal. Safety profile and comorbidity cost definitely the most important consideration in our country and flexibility that means with who is i can keep the most highest number of choice for future treatment of cm and imatinib the first tki is the most time tested and well established agent for the cml treatment and imatinib the first tki is, and with advent of newer tki does imatinib still remain, remain as the tk of choice in the first line that is the question and we look at the long-term outcome of imatinib treatment data, the iris trial, depending on which imatinib was approved in 2003, the long-term uh, analysis of that trial shows that with treatment with imatinib, overall survival is 83.3% after 10 years. We can see here with interferon and uh, the overall survival of 78.81, we should not be misguided with that because in iris trial, more than 70% of the patient very quickly switched over to the uh, actually uh, imatinib arm. So this, that, that does not mean the very good efficacy of the interferon at all because most of the treatment patient was ultimately treated with imatinib subsequent line and very short time for the interferon alpha. So that is a, a, a imatinib have shown very good result in terms of overall survival. But we have to remember that overall survival with imatinib in first line does not mean the patient were throughout treated with imatinib. They were treated first line with imatinib for the student, but they could have been treated with other agent subsequently when imatinib was failing. And 10 years overall survival, definitely it was 83.3% and 48.3% of patient assigned to imatinib arm either completed or on treatment with imatinib after 10 years. And definitely remaining 52% was switched to other treatment or required to switch to other, other treatment options. And 10 year overall survival was 10% in imatinib uh, 400 arm. It is coming from CML4 trial, almost parallelly run with iris trial. And 10 year progression free survival was 18%, 80% in imatinib 400 arm. 
at median follow up of 7.1 years 64% remained on the imatinib and only 22% switched to second generation generation tk the, the data coming from cml4 trial in germany and we have also came to know from a parallel analysis of iris data that uh, early molecular and cytogenetic response is a very good predictive for long term progression free survival and overall survival in chronic myeloid leukemia and how much we can see that uh, the patient who have got uh, targeted molecular level by eln criteria that is less than 10% by 3 months have survived significantly better than those population who have not achieved that target by three months and we can see uh, the survival was significantly different in population who got less than 10 percent target of bcrbl and those who have not achieved that and it was almost similar in the six month time timeline and can second generation TKI do better than imatinib as first line therapy? Because we know that molecular remission predict the survival. And we can see that later on we will see that molecular remission will be better with the second generation TKI. And it is the uh, milestone trial which compared dasatinib with imatinib in first line treatment. And this is the high VR uh, observation data of the decision trial. And the summary of the decision trial, same data favoring the dacetinib like major molecular remission at five years was 76 percent versus 64 percent. MR 4.5, that means deeper molecular remission in dacetinib was 42 percent versus 33 percent in imatinib. Transformation should accelerated phase or blastic phase was not very much significant. CMN related death was more in imatinib or and BCRABL less than 10% and three months was significantly better in desertinib. And what was the impact of less than 10% 10% BCRABL at three months? Impact was only 3% death versus 15%, sorry, 3% transformation versus 15% transformation in those groups who didn't achieve that target of less than 10% uh, BCRABL ratio by three months. And overall survival, and progression free survival was individually in both dasatinib and imatinib are it was shown that with bcrb less than 10 percent and three months was better survivor than the bcrb ratio more than 10 percent at three months and it was not actually uh, at the five year molecular remission was better for deep molecular remission was better it was throughout the period throughout the five year time with dacetinib or molecular remission, major molecular remission and deeper molecular remission, that means MR4.5 was significantly better in dacetinib than in imatinib. But when we come to the survival data, the overall survival was very much similar in both dacetinib and imatinib. That means that better molecular remission rate in dacetinib didn't transcribe into the overall survival and as well as progression free survival that was also almost similar in dacetinib and imatinib that means the, the data from decision trial didn't favor neither dacetinib nor imatinib are five year progression free survival five year overall survival was similar in both are and in both are the 61% and 63% was remaining on the trial treatment that is first line treatment by five years and BCRABL mutation was almost similar in both arm. However, in imatinib arm, there is no T3 on 5i mutation, but in dasatinib arm, rather bad to say that eight cases had T3 on 5i. Another landmark trial was NST ND trial, and five year analysis of that trial is here. And what are the data favoring the nilotinib? Again, major molecular remission, MR4 at five year and MR4.5 at five year. All three parameters are showing nilotinib 300, nilotinib 400 versus imatinib 400. Are significantly better molecular remission in 
nilotinib for 300 or 400 milligrams. And early molecular remission, that means less than 10% BCR-ABL also achieve better in the nilotinib arms comparing to the imatinib arm, only 67%. In comparison to 91 and 89 in nilotinib arms. And progression to accelerated phase and plastic phase was almost similar. Progression to uh, accelerated phase on study was also similar, but CML related death was significantly higher in imatinib arms. And when we say the subset analysis in the terms of 10 year, uh, uh, 10 early molecular remission, we can see that all the 400 are, again, less than 10% BCR ABL at three months significantly impacted the future major molecular remission. And nilotinib versus, and that also impacted the deeper molecular remission as well. But data, again here, the overall survival and progression free survival was almost similar in nilotinib arm and imatinib. Better, but not significantly better in nilotinib arms comparison to imatinib arms. So data favoring neither nilotinib nor imatinib is, again, progression free survival and overall survival. And what about bosutinib? Bosutinib, another uh, second generation TKI, it also proved that it is bosutinib. We have actually shorter experience about bosutinib. At uh, one year, it has shown that major molecular remission and complete cytogenetic response was better in bosutinib. And BCR ABL ratio less than 10%, which is another significant landmark, again better in bosutinib. And death was more in imatinib than in bosutinib. But again, overall survival was similar, but should be noted that experience is very short. So long-term efficacy data of bosutinib is yet to come. And summary of the decision in this trial shows that though better molecular remission in both dasatinib and imatinib, nilotinib arms, but progression-free survival and overall survival was similar. And when we include the result of before trial about bosutinib, though the uh, experience is shorter, it is again showing that in terms of overall survival and progression free survival, second generation TK are not significantly better. And in spite of clear superior outcome in all forms of molecular remission for all third generation, second generation TK over immunity, none of the second generation TK has been proven to be superior in terms of progression free survival and overall survival. What may be the problem, probable result? Most likely region should be excellent response to newer TKIs in subsequent line of patient in treated with imatinib and first, first line. Not that. When we treated imatinib in first line and that patient remained significantly sensitive to the second generation TKI in subsequent line. So overall survival with imatinib is still showing better, good comparable result. And one example is in Erestral shown that 66.7% of emerging mutation in imatinib treated groups were known to be sensitive to nilotinib but become resistant to imatinib. But the patient who was treated in first line with nilotinib, 68.1% of those became resistant to imatinib. That means when we treat nilotinib as first time, very few of the patient remain sensitive to imatinib in second line. So there, there is very limited role of nilotinib in second line. Sorry, imatinib in second line, but in nilotinib has. Which TK is superior in first line? Is there any difference in comparative data in different risk group? And we can see that in molecular remission, all risk group showing the superiority in uh, dasatinib arm from decision trial, but significance was shown only in the low risk group in case of major molecular remission and only in the intermediate risk group in the uh, in terms of deeper molecular remission. But to be noted that the scoring system was Hasport system, which is nowadays. Regular remission was better, 
in all our survival, we can see only in high so-called risk group, so is most time tested and broken yes however a number of TKI associated adverse events may potentiate risk of morbidity and mortality from pre-existing conditions like Imatinib, there is nothing significant condition which can potentiate pre existing condition. However, in Dasatinib, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary effusion, and platelet dysfunction can potentiate that. So, Dasatinib are contraindicated in. Which can be potentiated with some pre existing condition where neurotinib are contraindicated, like diabetes mellitus, pancreatic disease, pancreatitis, cardiovascular disease, or QT prolongation. However, bosutinib has very short experience, but bosutinib has shown in frequency of. TKI selection, we can see that when imatinib, in, imatinib is used in first time, we can use all the second generation TKI in second line with, according to the ABL mutation status. However, when second generation TKI are used in first line, subsequent TKI selection come from other second or third generation TKI only, but not imatinib remain as a choice. And degree of liberty, you can see that with imatinib in first line, we can choose any other uh, TKIs, and we are not compelled to think seriously about the are used in first line. We cannot keep imatinib in second line only, other second generation, third generation TKI, and we have to seriously think about the about the allogenic stem cell transplantation if that line is failed. So with most trusted safety profile and statistically non non inferior overall survival and progression free survival in comparison to second generation tki except in neurotinib in high so-called risk group and much lower cost and more wider option open for subsequent line of treatment imatinib still remain as the tk of choice in my view for first line treatment in chronic test cm however considering the significant better molecular remission with uh, all second generation TKI, further long term follow up of DASIS on INEST and before trial may predict better overall survival or progression free survival for second generation TKI in first line, like INEST and DASIS trial showing the result of five year only. After 10 years, it may show some better overall survival. However, second generation TKI in first line may, may be considered in higher risk CML patient. And second generation TK should be opted in first line in some condition like when treatment free remission is the treatment goal because deeper remission is required for the treatment free remission and that is significantly higher in the uh, second generation TK that will be discussed by uh, Professor Vikram later on. And young women intended to get pregnant where TFR should be treatment goal because uh, we have to discontinue imatinib before a lady get pregnant, imatinib or any TK. So, in conclusion, selection of TKI as a first line therapy in chronic test CML is imatinib largely remain as the TKI of choice in first line. Second generation TKI with significantly better MR status, especially better MR 4.5 status, may be considered for higher risk patient and for whom TFR is the treatment goal. And further long term follow up may reveal superior overall survival and progression free survival with first line and second generation TKI. So thank you all. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Professor Peter, of your sir, for his speech. 
am i audible yes now i will uh, invite our uh, distinguished speaker professor dr vikram mathew sir uh, for his speech before that i would like to introduce uh, him though every though he is very well known scholar uh, everybody knows him i would like to uh, tell uh, his profile uh, dr vikram mathews uh, professor dr vikram mathews is working as a professor and head in the department of hematology at christian medical college bello uh, he is uh, working in the field of hematology for more than 20 years he has completed his mbbs from dr mgr university in 1991 uh, and qualified as md in general medicine from same university in 1996 After that, he acquired the MD degree in clinical hematology from Dr. MGR, MGR University Tamil Nadu in 2001. He then obtained postdoctoral fellowship in stem cell biology from Washington University, Saint Louis, USA, in 2003. Later, he obtained fellowship in DMT and leukemia from Washington University, Saint Louis, USA, in 2004. He is an international speaker and international researcher, and he was peer reviewer of various international index journals. He is. Uh, he has interest on uh, leukemia. Uh, he has several papers on uh, acute promyelocytic leukemia, AML thalassemia. He is very cordial to us, and he visited Bangladesh for several times. And he is very well known, popular scholar in our country. So I invited Dr. Vikram Mathew sir to deliver his speech. So please. Thank you so much, Dr. Murthy. It was a very generous introduction. Uh, always a pleasure to be back. I wish I could be back in Dhaka. It would have been a lot better than doing a Zoom call. Uh, thank you, Dr. Akhil, for that uh, introduction. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, we can hear. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes sir. Yes. We yes, can yes, hear. Yes, okay. Yes, okay. I'm just going to share my slides. slides yeah yes sir okay okay so my brief for the next half an hour is to talk to you a little bit about treatment free remission uh, and dr takil's done a great job giving you an overview of all the data with uh, frontline therapy and choice of drugs and essentially uh, that's exactly what we do we still choose imatinib for the most part as our first line drug Uh, for the students out there in this audience, I presume there are lots of students on this uh, program. I think it's important that you recognize that there have been two sets of recent guidelines that have come. Both are freely available, and for students who are serious about this topic, I encourage you to read it. What is the European Leg Leukemia Net 2020 recommendations? And most of what I talk will be based on these guidelines. There is also the NCCN guidelines, which came about a little earlier this year, towards the end of last year. That's the 2019 guidelines. There have been a few drifts in terms of certain aspects in terms of management, and I think it's good as a student to read about it. Uh, I'm going to take a little step back uh, again in favor of the students in this audience, because if you're going to talk about treatment-free remission. I think it's very important to understand molecular monitoring. Uh, I sincerely hope you all can hear me. At any time, if you can't hear me, please do stop me and tell me. So, for students out there, this is the classical what we call a minute chromosome. Uh, can you see my arrow that is moving? Yes, sir. Okay. So that's what was initially recognized as a minute chromosome, and today we recognize that as a reciprocal translocation between chromosome nine and twenty-two. Good to acknowledge our uh, seniors in this field who have moved this field dramatically forward. Way back in 1960, Novell and Hungerford first described the uh, Philadelphia chromosome, but it was only in 1970 we realized the, the reciprocal nature of the translocation, and probably in 1984 that DCR able genes that were involved in this reciprocal translocation was recognized. I think it's important to kind of recognize how recent all these events were. And it was only in 1985 that people realized that actually this reciprocal translocation resulted in the activity or overactivity of an enzyme called alpha-tyrosine kinase, which is the Abelson tyrosine kinase. And in 1988, the first human volunteer took imatinib, and in 2081, imatinib was approved for the treatment of uh, CML. That's Noel and Hungerford, that's Janet Rowley, and that's Brian Drucker, and that's their individual contributions to this field. 
in a lifetime, the changes in this field for students, I think you need to understand, has been dramatic. When I joined uh, as a hematologist, when you were diagnosed CML, it was a death sentence. The median survival was three years. A few patients with some supportive care went on for five years. On an average, at the end of three years, you would progress to blast crisis, maybe five years. And then within six months of that blast crisis, majority of patients would die. Today, CML is almost like diabetes or hypertension. You take a tablet, you may not cure it, uh, but it stays under control and patients practically live a normal life. So this is the molecular biology, and it's important for you to understand this. In the BCR gene on chromosome 22, there is a major breakpoint cluster on near the exon uh, intron 13 and intron 14, between it surrounds exon 14, and there's a minor breakpoint over here, and there's another smaller, less common micro BCR. So basically, the breakpoint in chromosome 22 can happen at different locations. In CML, the common breakpoint is over here. While in Abelson, it's on chromosome 9, the breakpoint is predominantly in intron 1. So when you say this breakpoint, basically what happens, this entire component from 2 to 11 on Abelson moves and merges over here. So you can imagine if the breakpoint is here, the combination of this plus this will be P190 will be much smaller than if the breakpoint is here, in which case this entire component will go and merge with this entire component and you get the proteins, which are called the P190, which is more in ALL, the P210, which is more in CML. And depending on whether the breakpoint is at this particular location or includes 14, you can call it E113, E13, or E14. A2 is the common breakpoint on Abelson. These are small points, but they are important for you to understand because central to molecular monitoring at diagnosis is to recognize which type of isoform or breakpoint is involved, only then can you track it. Very, very, very rarely you can have more than one breakpoint, but that's extremely uncommon. Now let's talk about molecular monitoring. So you may wonder for a topic on treatment-free remission, why am I stressing so much on molecular monitoring? It is absolutely central to the entire concept of even moving to treatment-free remission. Now, many of you all have seen these slides, and I think most of you all will recognize it. Let's make an assumption that at the time of diagnosis, the BCR able copy number is 100%. And we won't get into how we got there, but that is the way that one gets there. Uh, and you may not actually use the individual person's value. You use what's called a normalized population-based value. You assume that's 100%. When you go down by one log, you reach 10 when you go down by two logs, you reach one person. When you go down by three logs, you reach 0.1 person. And when you reach a value less than 0.1 percent of where the disease was originally, you, as you say that the patient has achieved a major molecular response. If you go to a level four log reduction, 0.01 percent and less, you say it's MR4. And that's the correct terminology to use. And if it's MR 4.5, remember this is a logarithmic scale, so it's not 0 0.005, it's 0 0.0032 because it's a logarithmic scale. And if it's MR 5, it's less than 0 0.001%. I think it's very important for the clinicians among you all when you read these reports not to just take these values for their face value. For example, if you have an MR 4 less than 0 0.01%, Ask the lab if they have the chance to read at least 10,000 copies of the normal Abelson gene in their control. They're usually, they will run it to the control, which is the Abelson gene. And if the quality of the DNA is poor, or the sample is degraded, they may not get 10,000 ABL1 copies. And if they don't get that many ABL1 copies, you cannot read a value less than 0 0.01 of the BCR table. Similarly, to say MR 4.5, you must have at least 32,000 ABL1 copies, and MR 5, you should have at least 100,000 ABL1 copies. Why I stress on this so much is that we are making decisions on treatment-free remission based on these values, and it's very important to understand these values rather than just take a single value for its face value. Generally, we don't use the word complete molecular remission anymore, but in common parlance in the literature, anything less than MR5 
which is not detectable is taken as complete molecular remission. But the convention is to try and avoid using that terminology. And you need to ask your laboratory what is the limit of their detection and sensitivity of the assay that they have. And also to ask them whether they are part of a regular quality control program. So now I'm going to walk you through this slide of a leukemia in terms of numbers. Okay, so when you diagnose a CML patient, you may see 100,000 counts. And, you know, I'll shift to the left with normal hemoglobin and platelets. But what you don't realize is that at time of diagnosis, and this goes for many leukemias, there's anywhere between 10 to the power of 12 to 10 to the power of 14 malignant cells in the body. That is huge. That is like a million, million malignant cells. Okay. And when you give your initial treatment, whichever, in this case, CML, TKI, after a certain period, you reach a level of disease which cannot be detected by a conventional cytogenetics of bone marrow. But it does not mean that the, bone, that the disease has gone away. In fact, even if you have a 2-3 log reduction, you cannot detect it by bone marrow, but you still have more than 100 or 1,000 million malignant cells in your body. So as the disease load goes lower, you need more and more sensitive techniques like RT-PCR in case of the CML or RQPCR with a sensitivity of one in a million cells. Now, as the uh, MRD goes very low, remember at the very low end of the baseline, we believe that there is a certain fluctuation around the baseline before the disease may actually clear away in certain cases in leukemia. These fluctuations per se are not relevant if they are very low levels, if you're detecting at very low levels, because this has implications when you initiate treatment-free remissions and you see small, small changes, less than 0 0.001, et cetera, at the baseline fluctuating and you get worried. But you need to get worried when you see a trend. And if the trend that the serial values are climbing, and especially if it goes below major molecular response for sure, or more than MR4, then you start worrying. Now that is in terms of monitoring and disease, but also remember the rate at which the disease can drop after you start treatment has an impact. So for example, one patient can go at this pace, okay? He can go, instead of going like this down, he can go down very rapidly in a very short period of time to a very low value. Another patient can take a curve that goes more like that, okay? So this is called the slope of the curve. So both the speed of remission and the depth of remission, we now recognize is important. How do we know the speed of remission is important? Uh, Dr. Akhil alluded to that in his talk. When people have reached less than 10% within three months, they have a better response. So, so the speed of response, which is a reflection of the slope, but also important is the total depth that you can get the response with the treatment. And that's what we call, when you say deep molecular response, we're talking about less than 10 to the power, more than 4 or 4.5 log remission is what we generally refer to as deep molecular response. And the final component, of course, and this is ability to stay in that very low level of disease. So this is a little background information. All of you all are familiar with it. We also recognize that in our countries, we see much younger patients than they see in the West. Uh, and older patients, probably because of our pyramids, are probably uh, not as much. Now, it's important to define the treatment goals when you define treatment free remission. For the longest time, till I would say even the last few years, our expectation of treating CML was that we want to get a good life expectancy and a good quality of life. That's all we wanted. And today we know that by just continuing treatment continuously in patients with the long-term follow-up with imatinib and even now disatum and nilotinib, but the life expectancy on just continuing therapy in those who are doing well is close to that of an age match control. That means if you're 50 years of age and you were diagnosed CML and you were started on treatment and you are achieving all the appropriate timelines, you know, you achieve uh, complete, uh, uh, complete hematological response, complete surgical response, major molecular response, all you, you hit all the appropriate time goals you know, major molecular response by 12 months, and you retain, maintain that response, which is the majority of patients, their survival in comparison to the patient who does not have CML at that age is absolutely the same, or almost the same. We also want optimal quality of life and limited long-term organ toxicities. This is where we make a decision of which TKIs we want to use. But today, 
treatment-free remission is an accepted goal of therapy in 2020. It wasn't till now, but today in ELN, in NCCN, and in the real world, this is something that we are willing to look at as an option. And it may be the main goal for any patient, irrespective of age, but it is clear that the younger the patient, the stronger the case for achieving treatment-free remission. So in fact, our treatment goals in CML have moved. These few definitions I've gone through, uh, and again, Dr. Akhil has alluded to him, but I, I, it's very important to recognize that MMR is less than 0.1, MR4 is less than 0 0.01, and generally, we use the word deep molecular remission when it's less than MR4. And these are the timelines. I'm not going to go through this, but generally you want to reach a value less than 10% by three months, less than 1% by six months, less than 0.1% or a major molecular response. And beyond that, actually, as far as molecular milestones are go, you just want to maintain more than major molecular response. And there are the corresponding failures where you have to think in terms of changing therapy or doing something. The current frontline therapies has been addressed in great detail uh, by Dr. Akhil, and I'm not going to go through that. Uh, in terms of generic, as far as international recommendations go, only generic imatinib of the generics is approved on the international guideline. But today we have generic desatinib and generic imatinib, at least in India, and I'm sure that must be the case in, in Bangladesh as well. So we do have options, and cost of therapy is significantly less with the generic molecules. So is treatment-free remission, is this possible at all? The answer is an absolute and unequivocal yes. That is the answer based on all the experience that we have. Whether it's applicable to us for every patient, that's a different story. But is it possible? The answer is yes. Okay, and the panel, when I say the panel, I'm referring to the ELN panel, agrees that TFR is a new significant role in CML management. <clears throat> so why do we want to go for treatment? Free remission. I already told you that with continuing therapy, the age-adjusted expectation for life can be normal in a person who's doing very well and in continuous major molecular remission. So basically, potential for long-term organ toxicity with long-term PKI therapy. And some of these are very serious, okay, and probably underreported or not given enough attention to. So with long-term nilotinib, you can have peripheral artery disease and the incidence of coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease is quite high, reaching almost 20, 25%. And remember, both y'all and us, we deal with very young patients. When we start with patients on these drugs for a long time, the long-term toxicities are not something to be taken lightly, uh, which is why what Dr. Akil said is very important, that the longest data that we have is with imatinib. So if somebody is doing very well with imatinib, there's really, I don't see any reason you know, to change. The significant pulmonary hypertension can occur with uh, desatinib. I'm just quoting a few toxicities, but there are lots of other long-term toxicities. However, so we don't we would like to try and get rid of these drugs. Second is quality of life. All these drugs, in spite of them being well tolerated for the most part, do make patients feel not that well. Okay, and everyone learns to be cured. People who are young and who are in the reproductive age want to have children. Uh, this is more of a concern for women, and so uh, people would like to be off these drugs if they want. So the concept of cost of lifetime PKI therapy, but actually that's slightly different in our population, and I'll talk about that a little later. Now, when we talk about treatment-free remissions, I think these are some of the concepts that you have to keep in the back of your mind. I've already touched on them. You want to talk about the depth of remission that your patient has achieved, the duration of the remission that he's uh, achieved, what was the SOCAL score a diagnosis may have an impact, what did the first TK that he used, and did he have the appropriate time responses, the molecular responses with that frontline therapy, or did he fail frontline therapy? Do you have, or, uh, does the patient have access to high quality molecular monitoring? Is the patient have good socio-psychological support, is he reasonably intelligent? Does he understand the significance of the decision he's taking and compliance with medical advice? These are small points, but they're very important. And you and me know that we have many patients who it is very difficult to manage, you know, to come on time and to follow up, etc. There are economic considerations. When you read economic considerations in a Western paper, for the most part, they're talking about the cost of continuing TKI therapy. Okay. 
because they're saying cost of milot and about the pocket payments, you know, etc., are very high. But remember, in our country, with generic drugs, the cost of therapy actually is not so bad, and most patients can afford it. In fact, when you go to TKI, when you want to attempt treatment free remission, the amount of molecular monitoring that you have to do can be a substantial expense. At least in India, each test is quite expensive, and you're going to be doing this every month. And if this patient lives a little far away, he's going to have to travel, he's going to have to stay. So there is a significant economic consideration in a reverse direction, actually, for us uh, in, 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 the, in the developing countries. Okay, so this is the, the requirements for tyrosine kinase remission from the ELN guidelines. It's a little crowded slide, but I'm going to spend a little time because I think this is the essence of what you need to understand when you think, am I going to take my patient onto a treatment-free remission? So one, you want the patient to be in CML first chronic phase. There is no data outside first chronic phase on treatment-free remission. You want a motivated patient, as I mentioned earlier. You want access to high-quality PCR international standardization with a rapid turnaround of PCR results. That means within at least three weeks, the results should be available. Patients agreement to more frequent monitoring after stopping treatment. This means monthly for the first six months, every two months for six months to 12 months, and subsequently every three months for life. Now that's a lot, okay? Every month for the first six months and every two months for months six to 12. So six months to almost a year, you have to go uh, once in two months and then every three months. So there's a, a very frequent molecular monitoring. Some of the other criteria which may we allow, even if he doesn't fit in as far as Yalen goes, is first line therapy or second line intolerance. So people have noted that if you fail, you didn't do so well. But if you were intolerant to the first drug and you had to change the second generation or another TK and you did very well, you did not do too badly. Ideally, you want to take patients who have what I told you for the common breakpoints, B2, A2, B3, A2. When you go for these rarer ones, your lab will have some challenges in running these PCRs at that kind of a turnaround. And the whole quality control of the rarer transcripts is also a challenge. So you, you generally try to avoid going for treatment-free remission. Duration of TKI therapy, ideally more than five years, more than four years for a gen second generation TKI. Duration of deep molecular response, that is MR4 or better for at least two years, okay? And no prior treatment. Then there's an optimal rest recommendation by ELN, duration of TKI therapy more than five years, or deep molecular remission, that is more than MR4, more than three years of MR4, and more than two years of MR4.5. So if you reach MR4.5 very rapidly, and you were at least in MR4.5 more than two years, you could consider a treatment free remission. And this is where second generation TTI may have a role. And I stress on the word may, because it's not something I consider very often in my patients. This is a publication in Blood 2016. Okay, it includes it in a clear kind of a color code that is easy for many of us to understand. So I'll walk through green and red. When I say institutional criteria, each institution may have its own criteria. So it may be, it may be varying depending on the institution. So for example, in my institution, it may be a person who can financially afford a certain level of treatment and can afford PCR. A person who can come for follow-up at every one month. Not everybody who comes to our center can come that frequently. So each institution will have certain institution kind of specific criteria. He should fulfill that. There should not be so-called high-risk diagnosis common transcripts, CML passes only chronic phase. They had optimal response to first-line TKI. All the milestones that they should have hit, they hit. Duration of all TKI more than eight years. This is now, when I'm saying green, this is an expert opinion uh, by Tim Hughes, essentially. And depth of deep molecular response, MR 4.5. Duration of deep molecular response more than two years. So this is a useful guideline for you to have. If you have institutional criteria, if you need all the other guidelines, this is a patient where you can try treatment-free remission and possibly get success in close to 60-65% of cases. On the other hand, not meeting institutional criteria, not so-called uh, so high-risk or so-called not known, not quantifiable, BCR able transcript not known as one of the rare types, patient at any time has reached accelerated phase of blast crisis, failure at any point in time during his therapy, duration of TKI less than three years, 
never achieved an MR4, okay, and less than one year of deep molecular response. These are all criteria where you may want to seriously consider whether that you should not be going for a treatment-free remission. The ELN panel does not recommend a first-line second-generation TTI or change to a second-generation TTI for faster, uh, for faster deep molecular response, but agrees that a change may be considered in selected patients. So what do they mean by that? So for example, a person does not hit less than 10% at three months. It's a soft indication what you may consider. Patient has an intolerance, you may consider. But just for the purpose of achieving a faster DMR per se, is not an indication to start a second generation TTI. So the conditions that may include are younger patients, patients with whom TFR is a high priority. Patient comes, he, it's his choice. He really wants to be off therapy as quickly as possible. Women who wish to become pregnant. These are some situations where you may discuss a second generation TTI for this specific situation. But for the majority, that's not the issue. A second, a change from second generation TK to imatinib can be considered when no deep molecular response achieved within five years to avoid the risk of serious cumulative toxicity of second generation TK. As I mentioned to you, if you do go with second generation TK and you don't achieve a deep molecular response at five years, you may, in the absence of any other indication, you could consider switching back to imatinib uh, to avoid long-term complications with these drugs in the long run. Okay, that's an option that ELN gives you this time. It's important to understand the concept of TKI withdrawal syndrome. Uh, this was first described in imatinib, and it can occur with any TKI. Basically, when you abruptly stop TKI, patients can have severe flu-like symptoms, osteoarticular pain, usually mild to moderate, about 30%. Some low-grade fever, flushing, usually resolves spontaneously or upon analysis prescription within a few months. It's believed to be because the TKIs were suppressing a lot of cytokines. When you suddenly remove these TKIs, you get a slight cytokine storm. And this can cause this non-specific arthralgia, etc. Usually it's mild, does not require any treatment. Occasionally it can be severe and may require a short course of steroid. But it's important to keep it in mind if a patient presents with this after stopping the drug. Some clinical trial data that I'm going to go through. The first study, really the proof of principle, was the STOP, the STIM trial, which is the STOP imatinib trial, published by Mahon, which is a French study. And this study actually encompasses and captures all the elements that we recognize with treatment-free remission study. Okay, you can see at, uh, at a short follow-up, the, the progression free or survival with, without molecular relapse was about 40%. Okay, there are 100 patients in this study. And on short-term follow-up, that's that on, on longer follow-up, it went down to treatment-free remission, went down to only 41%. This is an important statement. Most molecular relapses occurred within the first six months of discontinuation. But on longer follow-up, patients continued to recur, disease continued to come back. And by 60 months, there was only 38% who continued to remain in treatment-free remission. Okay, so... There's a whole lot of studies out there, and the objective of putting up this slide is not by any stretch of imagination for us to go through it, but just to tell you both in the, with imatinib and with second generation TKIs, there's a whole lot of studies and varying degrees of numbers. There is a lot of heterogeneity in these studies, as I'll point out later. But the broad take home point if you want one figure, if you fulfill all the criteria for treatment free remission, plus minus a few percentage points this side and that side. About 50% chances that you will remain, if you follow all the stringent criteria to enter into treatment-free remission, may remain off therapy. Varying from about 30% to about 65%. Okay, so on an average, about 50% of patients, you may be able to actually sustain this. Now, if you look at all these studies, what is clear is the study designs are very different. While almost all of them have been done in adult patients with major molecular response, the duration of which they were off PK, on PKIs varies. The duration of time they were in major molecular response or molecular uh, response 4 plus is variable. The definition of relapse or, or loss of uh, response is also variable. Some will take that if they get any detectable copy numbers, it's a failure. Some would say only if it's 
if it's more than MR 4.5 or MR 4, it's a loss of response. While some would say only if they have lost major molecular response, is it a, is it a, is it, is it a failure on the study? And so these values can have significantly different survival curves. So this is one study on the, uh, on the stop uh, uh, TTI study that was, that was reported. If you took MMR or loss of major molecular response only, your relapse rate was, was the relapse rate survival was 65%. But if you took any detectable BCR able as your endpoint, it was only 37%. But remember that first study that I, first graph that I showed you about movement around the baseline. So every person who just has a detectable BCR able is not necessarily going to have progressive disease, okay? But it's important, and the reason why I put up this slide and the previous data is it's very difficult to compare any two studies. So be careful about just looking at a value and saying, this TFR value looks better than that study. There are just too many variables to account for. Now, why is MMR generally taken as the point of relapse, okay? Most studies and practices would start, restart treatment. So you stop the patient on treatment, you're continuing to do this intensive molecular monitoring. When will you restart treatment, okay? And there was a lot of debates. Initially, people were very cautious. If they lost MR4 itself, they would start treatment. Some would even start treatment if there was any detectable BCR able. But today, the consensus is only if the patient loses major molecular response. That means the value becomes more than 0.1. Even the NCCN and SMO trials follow this. Would you start treatment? Okay. Uh, and, and that is why that, that values less than MMR, we now recognize there is a certain fluctuation around the low baseline levels between detectable and just detectable and not detectable, which you don't necessarily have to remember. Okay? Now, what are the predictors of response to therapy? Okay? This follows all that I have said before. The depth of remission, obviously, the deeper the remission, the more likely. The duration of remission, the longer you've been on therapy and you've consistently been in deep remission, the better the response. If you had low risk disease at onset, what about the type of TKI at frontline? Actually, there is no good head-to-head -head comparison to say that your chance of staying in remission longer if you had a second generation TKI. The probability that you would get onto a treatment-free remission study is more because of the higher and faster response. But there's no data to head-to-head -to -head comparison to say that the duration or the chance of staying in treatment-free remission is higher if you had a second generation TKI upfront. If patient never had a suboptimal response of failure, he has a better chance. If MR less than 4.5, if, if after stopping treatment, if the MR is less than 4.5 at three months post stopping therapy, there's a significant better chance that you will remain in treatment-free remission as seen, as seen in the stop second generation TKI study. There are some immunological parameters, but beyond this, it's all in the basic science research whether it's uh, teloma length or whether it's NK cell levels or different types of immune response correlating with some patients doing better. And finally, are there different ways to do TKI? Yes, there are. Some people have said, why abruptly stop? First, de-escalate the dose of the TKI by 50% for one year. And then if the patient remains stable and is not progressing, only then stop. So this is called the DESTINY trial. And what the destiny trial would like to say is that they probably got a better response in these patients and they hypothesized by reducing the dose to half, you probably had a better immunological recovery and more stem cells from the leukemic, from the CML stem cells coming into cycle and being hit by the therapy. All hypothesis at this point in time, but that's the data. The red curve is patients who were MR4 and less who had a better TFR as expected compared to the MMR, but all these patients had therapy half for 12 months and only then stopped. And for the 64 patients odd who did lose their major molecular response, when they started treatment, 91% of them went back to their original less than major molecular response. So that is very reassuring. I'm gonna stop here and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention. 
I must take the fast. I must. Uh, we started fast question uh, to the Vikram. I am eagerly waiting for this question actually. Uh, according, to, I, I have not uh, one uh, question answer from ELN guideline. In ELN guideline, it has been told that during the uh, starting treatment free remission, we have to monitor the patient every one month in, in yes. past six months. Yes. In my sense, if a patient is in uh, MR 4.5, he is not going to lose this to a MMR within two months. Then why not? If I find at one yeah. month yeah. less than 4.5, why not I wait for yeah. two months rather than one month? Yeah. So what Dr. Akhil is talking about is the dynamics of disease progression. And we understand that the dynamics of population of the cells is such that if you reached a level below certain things, it takes at least one, two months to reach a level where it can become more than, you know, M, uh, less than MMR. But I think those are the guidelines that they have put. I think they want to put it be safe, absolutely safe in these patients. And you have to always assume that there'll be some patients who may by chance progress faster than that. And they don't want to lose the window of intervening as quickly as possible. But your point is absolutely valid. Uh, what, what is your recommendation if, if in, in low resource country, if I modify this guideline, while informing the patient against the cost, uh, uh, against yeah. the risk. That's a call you have to make individual to individual center, Akhil. Very difficult for me to say. To be honest with you, we are not gung-ho about treatment-free remissions. We have challenges with patients being able to come back. Yeah. Challenges yeah. with patients who can afford such molecular monitoring yeah. and regular monitoring. So it is an exceptional patient, actually, where we actually go for treatment-free remission. That is our practice, you know, outside the setting of a clinical trial. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Doctor. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Your voice is a little soft. I hope uh, my voice is not soft, is it? Thank you. Can you hear me your... clearly? Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry. So, thank you for your nice presentation. And now it's time for question answer session. I would like to request our panelists if they have some questions to our speakers, they can directly ask their questions. Then we will go for uh, the question answer box. There are six questions. Should I read out the questions or our panelists will ask some questions to our speakers? Yes, yes. Yes. yes uh, I, 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 am, I am Professor Dr. Ahim Kawajan from Rampin Medical College. Sorry. I have a question to uh, Professor Vikram Methus. Uh, in our country, medicine patients are poor. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. In our country, mixed patients are very poor. They have no ability for bone marrow transplantation. Can omocystazine, a chemotherapy agent, used to treat chronic or, or extreme phase of female that is resistant to or intolerant to two or three uh, TKIs? Which drug? Two or three more TKIs resistant to. Can you hear me? I, I can uh, hear you, but I yeah. forgot the drug that you wanted to use. Omacetacin. Okay, so it's not available for us. So we have very little experience with it. I had one patient who was on Homo Harrington who was actually getting the drug from China. Uh, but uh, if you have access to it, that's, a, that's an option. I, I think about 20-30% uh, of patients who are multi-TKI resistance do respond is my understanding of the data. But I have very little experience with it because it's not available in India. Thank you. It's neither in Bangladesh. It's neither oh, in Bangladesh. okay, okay. Any other questions from anyone? So we will go to question answer box. There is a question. Uh, I have. Yeah, Dr. Okhil. Dr. Okhil, can you hear me? I can Hello. hear. I can ah. hear. Yes, I can hear. Yes, and there is a case scenario. A 17 years old boy, this gentle boy, Diksha Pullard, no case of same age, B-cerebral positive. He has been treated with hematidity for one year. But suddenly he developed fever, weakness, and rash. His CBC reveals hemoglobin 6 gram per DL, WC count 1000, yes. lymphocyte. 
I missed. I missed. Another round. Another round. Another round. Another round. For ten seconds. Can you please? Sir, can you? Sorry, sorry, I missed it. You're you're muted. You're muted. Uh, I am muted, me? but I missed. The, I can hear now. I can hear now. Okay. Seventeen, seventeen years, seventeen years, gentle boy, rickshaw puller. Yeah. Known case, known case of CML. Known case of CML. Yeah. B side, B side is positive. Yes. He was treated with with immunity for one year. But suddenly, suddenly developed fever, rash, and and weakness. His CBC reveals hemoglobin six gram, total WBC count one thousand, neutrophil ten, lymphocyte ninety, and platelet count only ten thousand. So I stopped imatinib. Then patient was treated with injection meropenem one gram three days for seven days. Then the uh, injection kilgrass for five days. Test blood transfusion, antiviral, antifungal, health promoter pack. And all kinds of vitamins, but after five days, his CBC reveals hemoglobin nine gram. Nine gram total W W C can only one point five thou. Neutrophil fifteen, lymphocyte eighty five, and platelet count only eighty thousand, eighteen thousand, eighteen. Yes. Then I again treated him with meropenem for three days. Injection take filgrass for three days. Antiviral, antifungal, antithrombotic, and, and, and other drugs. After three days, his CBC reveals hemoglobin 8.5 gram. Total WC count only 1.5000. Neutrophil 15, lymphocyte 85, and platelet count only 10,000, 10,000. Patient again develop hemoptysis, hemoptysis and ichthyosis. And patient uh, have no ability uh, for further treatment, and patient delay to go to Dhaka. So what uh, is the next uh, uh, plan of treatment? I am uh, I am actually concerned about the practical scenario. That is, we actually have lost the dynamic of this. How this patient came to this that degree of pancytopenia? As we didn't have the interim, uh, I didn't uh, find uh, hear anything from you about the interim follow up of the patient what was his uh, molecular status what was his hematological division status so i cannot really predict whether it is due to uh, uh, hematological toxicity with which we didn't stop the drug and patient went to aplasia or we are we are not sure whether it is uh, just blastic transformation of the disease most likely to be blastic transformation of the disease uh, professor vikram can tell it clearly whether imatinib can Create such degree of aplasia, but I am I I fear it it could be a blastic transformation which is presenting with pancytopenia, and where man would be uh, loaded with lots of blast. I, I I think. Yeah, I I think if it's sustained, you need a bone marrow first to evaluate it. But I think this I think the point uh, I agree with uh, what uh, Dr. Akhil was trying to say was that if you had monitored it early and you found a trend dropping. If you had stopped it earlier, there may be a chance for recovery, and then you know an option of changing to a second CN patient CK, etc. But sometimes, if you flog it without recognizing, and the patient keeps on on the drug when it's already in when he's having significant hematological toxicity, you could end up with permanent aplasia, uh, and then it's difficult to salvage it from there. Uh, but in this particular case, I think the first thing you need to do, you cannot assume. That it is something you need a bone marrow to make sure we are dealing with aplasia versus the blood vessel. Sorry, uh, sorry, I, I forget it. I also done bone marrow, but bone marrow, bone marrow reveals aplasia. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Unfortunately, the only option for him, if it's sustained, I'm not sure how long it's sustained, is a transplant. There's not much options otherwise. Okay. Thank you. The next. If any one of our panelists <coughs> have any question, you can ask, or I will go to the question answer box. There are a few questions. Uh, there is a question uh, to to Akhil sir. Uh, in case of childbearing women, we should better use second one as first line therapy. This is the first question. So please answer. Because the uh, already the uh, professor Vikram discussed that because. Yeah. We we cannot use any TKI during pregnancy, so 
when your lady is planning to get pregnant, he sh she should go treatment free remission. So for treatment free remission, we need deep molecular response. And from all that, it is being shown that deep molecular response remission is uh, higher in case of second generation TK. Second, uh, there's yeah, a scenario. So, 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 I have a slightly Sorry. different uh, perspective. I yeah. mean, all that is theory. Eh? You must remember that yeah. some of my talk is all theory. Uh, and that is, I have to give you a balanced view of what is there in the literature. In, yeah. in the real world, I almost never ever start second generation TK on a woman in the reproductive age group because there's, yeah. it's an exceptional patient who can actually, you know, thinks in, the, in those lines for the patients that I have. Uh, it's a theoretical option. Okay. And you should, uh, you know, all of us, I'm sure in Bangladesh and India, we have a spectrum of patients who can afford anything. And the majority who it's a challenge, okay? And I'm saying for the majority of patients, I don't even bring it up as a point of discussion. That's the honest truth, you know, because there's no point giving them some illusion that something can be done different, you know, because it's a challenge getting this day-to-day -day treatment for them. I hope I'm making my point clear. I'm not saying... Yeah, yeah, clear. Yeah, so it's clear, sir. So in the second uh, question, there is a case scenario, uh, 24 years patient clinically and hemogram shows features like CML, BCR ABL was negative. At first, uh, he was treated with hydroxyurea, but deteriorating gradually. At that situation, uh, the physician started TKI, uh, TKI first generation with hydroxyurea. Within two months, all signs symptoms disappeared and patient improved. Now he is well uh, in chronic phase. We want to evaluate him further, but due to COVID situation, we cannot uh, we cannot send his sample for PCR study to see molecular response. The question is: Is it possible for a BCR level negative CML can respond with imatinib? Uh, triptych BCR level mutation is that possibly? The comment, please, Victor Matheson. So, so in, in today's world, there is no concept of BCR level negative CML. Uh, you, you, you can call it an amyloproliferative neoplasm, NOS, so you know you can't classify it. But there is no concept of bcr able negative CMF. That doesn't exist uh, by definition. So in this particular case, you said bcr able positive. I'm really not sure what method or technique was used, you know, whether it was uh, uh, FISH or RT-PCR or what they used. I, I, would, I would personally feel very uh, uncomfortable treating a patient like this with both imatinib and hydroxyurea without having a label diagnosis. It's reasonable in this situation, if the, if the physician is pushed to a corner, to start hydroxyurea as you would do with any other myeloproliferative neuroplasm. That again, depending on how high the counts were, how rapidly. You know, so many early myeloproliferative neuroplasms is just wait and watch. You really don't do anything, you know, you can wait. Uh, but once you start imatinib and then you started hydroxyurea as well, it's actually impossible to say what is going on. You know, it's difficult. I, I want to add a bit. Uh, starting from the uh, Dr. Matthews, he, he rightly told that actually no BCR ABL negative CML right now. But only one thing we should consider that is most of the PCR lab may not include all the possible. Uh, mutation point in their primer chart. So sometimes with PCR, a very few number of BCR will maybe miss. If there is a high degree of suspicion from the morphology like significant basophilia, eosinophilia, bone marrow with microcryocyte, in that case, we should do fish as well along with PCR to exclude there is no BCR. Thanks, sir. Uh, uh, what is the best time to switch from imatinib to second generation TKI is a question. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I missed that question. What is uh, the question? Uh, so the question is, uh, what is best time to what switch, is best time to switch imatinib to TKI? Uh, uh, it is required time actually, best, not best time, but yeah. time required. You know, if you want to go very simply, just follow the failure criteria that is there for timeline and say that is a definite indication to switch. The suboptimal is very borderline. Uh, I think students out there must understand that frankly, doesn't matter which TKI or which drug, 
if you have not if you have not reached a level less than one percent, there is actually no difference in survival. So, uh, so I think it's good to keep that in the back of our minds, especially in, in, in our countries where we have a lot of poor people. As long as the patient is in complete cytogenetic response, and that translates to a value less than one percent, okay, you don't really have to worry or do anything, okay, okay. <clears throat> There's a question for Akhil sir. What is the dose of dazatinib as first line treatment? 50 mg or 100 mg per day? It's 100 milligram. It's established. Unless there is not a physical toxicity in a special situation. Uh, That's a trick question, Akhil. There's a study from MD Anderson that has uh, used 50 milligrams up front and showed better results than 100 milligrams. But really? it's a single so, center so, study, and I would, I would be. I wouldn't jump to that conclusion, but I can see where the person is coming from. Okay. Uh, in many, uh, for Vikram sir, there is a question. In many laboratories, they said that the patient is in MMR after one year without starting the actual AVL1 copy. And what should we do then? You cannot interpret it. I, I, I no, want to really stress can. this. Yes. Sir, this we come across there are lots of several labs. cases I'm like sure this. Same, same problem in India, same in Bangladesh. Just proliferating labs, you know, they just give you one value. It means nothing. That value means nothing unless you ask the right question. So if you don't have your control gene copy numbers adequate, you cannot interpret it. And you should not interpret it. Invalid result, actually. Yeah. Result is invalid. But we are in trouble then. Uh, what to do? We should continue the drug as before. We should just, just repeat the test with, with, with some... Mm, better lab yeah, who have a real copy number at least more than 10,000. Now, if, if you're outsourcing it, I think before you outsource, you have a right to ask the lab one, two, three. Do you do this? Do you issue reports with this? Is, uh, I mean, I'm happy to send it to you, and I'm sure Dr. Akhil can easily send it to you. There are fixed criteria that must be there on the report, and you can ask the lab, I want to see these values on the report one. Second, I need to know at what frequency, what QC methods are you being following in your lab? I think that's a reasonable question to ask, and I think all clinicians should ask. I have a question to Vikram, sir. At three months, uh, our, uh, what will be the control ABL1 copy? It will be 1,000 or 10,000? No, no, no. It's not the ABL copy numbers is how you interpret the value of your BCR ABL. The lower the BCR ABL you want to read out, the higher the ABL1 copy should be available. So it's basically telling you, say you had, um, you, had, you, had, you had 100 fruits. Just imagine you had 100 fruits on the table, okay? And you want to know of the 100 fruits, how many were apples, okay? And so every time they give you 100, you say 10 apples, 5 apples. Now, one day they give you only 5 fruits and there are no apples. It doesn't mean there's no apples. It just means that there are less fruits. Yes. We don't have yes. enough choice. You understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, sir. So if you don't have enough material, by random chance, you don't have BCR able. But it's just that you've not counted enough to say how much is it left. So it should be at least 10,000 copies. At least 10,000. But okay. when you get to lower values, it has to be even higher. 100,000. Yes, 100,000. 100, yes, sir. Thanks, sir. Uh, so the next question is how to follow up CML in pregnancy. Follow up? Or you're talking CML, about... Sir, how to follow up a CML patient in pregnancy? Pregnant when, CML patient. When you say follow up, you're talking about treatment or monitoring? Monitoring okay. is the same. Okay. Treatment wise, theoretically, you stop the TKI, you give interferon, all theory. I've never done it. Okay, nobody can afford interferon over here and nobody can tolerate interferon. Okay, so in reality, this is the honest truth. Most women continue imatinib on pregnancy. The probability of having genetic abnormalities is extremely low. You, you have to have an upfront conversation with the family and tell them this is the risk for benefit. For me, the way I come from is if there is no mother, that child is doomed. Okay, so for me, the mother's life is absolute priority. So in a very resource constrained environment, I say, take your chances. And I say, you have two options. One, go for an abortion if you don't want zero risk. Alternatively, you take your TKI, you may have a cleft palate or you may have some minor abnormalities. 
for the most part, the reported abnormalities are extremely small. Now, this is the unofficial statement. If you ask me an official statement, I'll say, yes, you must stop TKI. The medical legal angle, even in India, is stop TKI. But the ground reality is, I'm telling you, that's not possible. Okay. And the uh, mother's life is much very important as far as I'm concerned. I have a question to Professor Vikram Mathis. Uh, some, uh, we have not opportunity to discontinue uh, imatinib because uh, uh, you know the laboratory is, is uh, our laboratory is so not so much accurate to give the deep, uh, PCR uh, level. My question is: Do you have a, a plan or idea to reduce the dose? Some British group of uh, of studies show the discalation of the therapy. I mean, is yes. reduce the half of the dose of the imatinib? Do you have it? Something, uh, some uh, like experiences to re reduce the dose of the. Uh, I, I, I would never reduce the dose of imatinib unless I'm forced to due to cytopedia or some other problem. If I'm going for treatment-free remission and I'm reducing it one year and then stopping as is done in a study, I have never done that and I never do that. To be honest with you, I just continue the bets. Mm. Oh, another question is, is just, there is so many generics in, in our country is now generating the imatinib. Is that right? In this situation, uh, some some article in my experience is that if we switch the one generation drug to another generation, uh, generics, there's just some chance of uh, transformation of the disease. Formation uh, of a? Transformation of the disease. No, no. We change the generics, generics okay. of the drugs. Uh, so in my view, is, is some article is to do not change. And if it is possible to continue the same generic, same generic, to continue uh, lifelong. Do not change uh, another generic. What is your recommendation in, in this? Uh... I, I really don't think there's any basis for that as long as the generic is a good quality. The problem with generics is, uh, in India, I can tell you, there are a lot of generics which are really bad, okay? But within the, within the local environment, you know what is reliable and what is not reliable, okay? And that's difficult to quantify. Okay, uh, but if you quantify it, and if you have, uh, if you have the appropriate drug, I, I really don't think there's a reason for that. What you're saying to happen, the most likely probability is absence of the drug or suboptimal dosing or, or suboptimal formulation of the drug. Uh, there's two questions. One for Vikram sir. In case of using first line TKI, if we stop several times due to neutropenia, is it an indication of, of treatment failure of the TKI? Yes, it is more treatment intolerance rather than treatment failure by definition. Uh, but you may have no choice, but you may not be able to continue. And there are many patients we have like that. It's a difficult group. There's no easy answer, to be honest with you. There's a lot of theories, but it's very difficult to manage. Some people just don't tolerate the drug, you know. And you and me have the same problem that most of them cannot afford anything else. So you are left with giving suboptimal doses. And so it's a challenge. Okay, I don't have an easy answer. <clears throat> I have a question regarding the Philadelphia positive ALN. Sometimes we use the dasatinib in a, with hyper effect protocol. In this situation, sometimes the platelet count is uh, uh, less than 10,000 or 20,000. In this situation, I actually reduce the dose as a 20 or 40 milligram, or sometimes maybe as, as late as 20, 20 milligram. So, what is the recommendation? When Which drug? Dasatinib. Yeah. Dasatinib is usually reduce the platelet count as well uh, as if, if we do associate with the chemotherapy. So, in this situation, sometimes we have to reduce the dose. 50% or 75%. What is your recommendation in this situation? Yeah, I mean, if you have to reduce the dose, you reduce. Desatinib is one of those drugs where the lower dose is still quite effective. So I think there's fairly good data with even 50 milligrams of desatinib. 50 milligrams of desatinib is as, as efficacy as 100 milligrams. Some article. Uh, I, I don't want to go out of my, on a limb and say that. But there seems to be some preliminary data, at least in chronic phase CML, that it may be true. Oh, another question is some uh, article is shown that digital PCR is a um, hundred times better than the. Sir, we are running out of time. RQ PCR. So, 
in future, I, I, maybe it, it replaces the digital PCR to RQ PCR. Sometimes it means the uh, miss more of the Abelson gene. So, what is your future plan uh, to to uh, monitoring the, the, this GMR by digital PCR? Yeah. So theoretically, there are lots of advantages, lack of requirement for controls, etc. Uh, I I'm I'm really not sure, to be honest with you, whether digital PCR will become widely available for everybody to monitor. You know, when RT PCR is so standard and established and available, that it's more sensitive, probably true. There's a last question. If a patient achieves uh, complete cytogenetic response, but not MMR, even after two years of TK, what would we do? The, the theoretical answer is you must switch. Okay, no doubt about it. But the, in the real world, actually, this is the group of patients I'm telling you are actually doing well. You will see that they're absolutely well. They have not achieved major molecular response, but they're, they're, not, they're in complete cytogenetic response and their molecular value is, is less than 1%. Actually, they do very well and you can probably continue them on the same drug. Thanks, sir. Uh, we are running shortage of time and now I will uh, invite our chairperson uh, of this session, Professor Dr. Masta, madam, to comment on today's webinar. Yes, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, today's topic is a very time demanding topic for us because the CML patient is uh, on the uh, first line of TKI therapy, continue a long time. So, I would like to give thanks first of all, Dr. Professor Rockfield, his nice presentation, and secondly, Dr. Vikram Mathus, he also is a uh, renowned professor and give us time for the for our student and for us it is a very good for us with this new thing the mmr and uh, cytogenetic response so my, I, I have one question to uh, this is not for question time even that i am i want to do uh, a question uh, to become mathus there what uh, was the uh, second tki in case of first failure of the first imatinib tki and the, those people who have suffered from thrombocytopenia. Who have suffered from thrombocytopenia. Yeah, yeah. using so dasatinib. If, if cytopenia has been the major intolerance, probably nilotinib is the better drug than dasatinib because you have significant cytopenia or dasatinib. But usually the second generation TKI, you choose it on multiple factors. Uh, so, for example, if the patient has a lot of comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, yes. I'd probably go yes. for desatinib rather than nilotinib. Uh, while if the patient has mm -hmm. cardiac problems, has severe cytopenia, I'd probably go with nilotinib rather than desatinib. Yes, oh, uh, should we uh, should we switch to another TKI or continue desatinib with the uh, uh, cytopenia between twenty to forty thousand? So do you switch on to nilotinib or continue dopinib with thrombocytopenia, uh, thrombocyte count 3,000 or 3,000? 3,000? 20 to 3,000. 30,000. So small you small probably need time? to change the TKI. If it's toxicity. If it's toxicity, if it's uh, hematological toxicity due to, due to desatinib, you need to change the drug. Uh, Not here, no problem. Some of these, some IT blame. So, okay, this is uh, time running out my time. Mm. I would like again give thanks to Professor Vikram Mant and Professor Dr. Alan for their speech. A lot of questions. Hopefully, we'll see <laughs> another day. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, madam. Can you um, hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear yes. you. I can hear you. Yes, ma'am. Thanks, uh, madam, for your uh, comments. Now I will invite our scientific partner, Healthcare Pharmaceutical, for a uh, brief for their presentation. Shortly. Healthcare Pharmaceuticals. Okay. 
can can you hear me yes okay uh, i'll not take that much time because <laughs> we have already passed our the time schedule that we are expected to be closing today so uh, i'm just uh, going straight away to the presentation and i'll not make it uh, that much elaborative so is it visible right yes yes, yes. Yeah. okay so thank you uh, akhil sir thank you vikram sir uh, thank you uh, master madam aziz sir and all the uh, learned uh, audience and speaker today to give us such a wonderful time with so much informative things and i'm just uh, sharing you today the efforts that we are uh, putting into our uh, brands and the products and we actually value the efforts and uh, the, the, I'm, I'm just showing you a brief of our efforts that we are uh, putting into our brands. Uh, the effort that is ensured the quality and safety parameters that is the prior concern of uh, a, any of the manufacturer but we have make it very much precise and very much uh, uh, very much uh, in, um, consistent uh, in, in terms of quality and safety parameters. And that includes the API and the experience, the production facility, then storage, distribution, and the precaution of proper users. What is API? We all know uh, that is the main ingredient that is that is actually responsible for the uh, exert of the actual efficacy. And uh, we have our API that we uh, uh, imported from the various uh, manufacturer that is globally renowned. Some of them like Teva, Dr. Reddy's, and uh, there are some also. Big uh, generic manufacturers and that has all the certifications like the USDMF, CEE, EDMF, and JPDMF. That that includes uh, the major regulation of the uh, different uh, countries and the USDMF part. That actually the from the US certification, CP from the European, EDMF also same the European and the Japan DMF. That is uh, the regulation from the JPDMF. And the formulation we have that has also some collaboration with the global partners. And the impurities and residual solvent, that is the major part that actually ensures the uh, quality of the products because uh, each and every product must have some impurities in terms of the fin finished API because that has uh, to pass through different chemical reactions that actually ends up with the finished product and that might include some uh, impurities and that should be regulated by the global regulation that is the ICH and USP how, at which quantity and parameters that should be present there. and that also we have some recent incidents of uh, impurities that is like uh, uh, that have some genetic uh, interference with, uh, with the with the disease. Is all the residual solvents or impurities are genotoxic? Uh, is absolutely not, but there are some genotoxic materials and we should, that should be in within the limit to maintain the optimum quality. And the primary packaging that is a major part. We have the primary packaging from global leaders like the foil from Mport. And the vials that we have been using, that is from the short Germany, and the rubber stopper that is from the depth wheeler, that is also important for as well as the total quality parameters. And the production guidelines, that is 100% uh, uh, accompanied by the uh, OEB5 regulation. These are the, some uh, key features of our production facilities that we have uh, at present in our production facility. And it, it also uh, ensures the uh, OSHA and NIOSH guidelines that, uh, that, that, uh, that actually says the OEB level 5 should be maintained in, in, in terms of uh, uh, actual production quality maintained and all the things. And we have the certification for our distribution network uh, that has already, uh, al already has been uh, well certified by all the uh, global uh, organization. And in some cases, we have uh, distribution with Lily and uh, Mark Sharp and Dom, and they have already uh, established the, uh, that the quality of the facility of our distribution. And we have a stringent pharmacovigilance policy, and these all are the quality things that we actually uh, do uh, in our practices, practicing each and every day and each and every product. So uh, from, with the same quality, same attributes, we are now launching our uh, new brand that is uh, healthcare Oncology introduces uh, the Dasatinib, that is the Danib, and uh, that is the Dasatinib of healthcare. And uh, that is the, from our part, and thank you so much for giving us some time. Thank you. Thank you, healthcare pharmaceuticals. Yes. Now I would like to request our um, Abdulaziz sir for uh, speech, as president.
as our president is not present to today's webinar. So I will conclude the session with vote of thanks and will give a speech as president of which is yes, yes, yes. Sir, Adit sir. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Humaira Nazmin. Uh, you nicely, uh, nicely manage everything in today's seminar. And uh, actually, uh, uh, good afternoon. And today is CML day. And in this CML day, the theme is for a life without CML. For a life without CML. I think it is uh, real and uh, there is uh, the rationality. In 1998, before uh, at that time, CML is present disease in our country, but all uh, as well as all over the world. If uh, Vikram Mathur sir telling that exactly the, before that, at 1998, before that, uh, a, a, a CML, oh, we were uh, uh, yeah, suffering from CML. Uh, you are graveyard in three to six months, but situation is very now at time because there are so many drugs, uh, targeted drugs in uh, all over the world. It is just like a, um, uh, just like diabetes or hypertension. So for the for this reason, they, 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 this is a real theme to this year. Uh, I am Professor Dr. Abdul Aziz. For, Head of the Department of Chairman, Department of Hematology, and also the uh, Secretary General of Bangladesh Society of Hematology. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank our uh, today's seminar president, Professor Masuda Begum. Uh, also, thanks to our expert panelists. Next uh, comes to our Ramadeva uh, to speakers both are renowned national and international uh, my dear uh, in front of our webinar the respected teacher colleagues beloved students assalamu alaikum uh, i am feeling honored to give vote of thanks or to say something about uh, uh, our webinar first of all uh, my so society president, Professor Mahabubu Rahman, he lost his father uh, on the uh, day before. So uh, uh, we are uh, praying for the uh, departed soul. Uh, may Allah rest in peace and may Allah give him Janna. Uh, uh, another uh, thing is that the, uh, uh, any type of webinar or seminar uh, organized, there are so many bothering. Uh, uh, behind it, Professor Mahabur Rahman uh, organized this program nicely along with our scientific secretary, Professor, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mainul. I would like to give thanks to Dr. Mainul. Uh, our panelists, I, I think the one thing is that in front of me, question of answer is uh, uh, around 12. Uh, it is. It is. It means that the, our program is very much interactive and very much successful. In, in, in any other any other way, that there is no question. But uh, we are enjoying lot of a lot because uh, we have found uh, two speakers. Uh, one is Akhil Ranjan Bishar. Uh, Akhil is uh, our. Uh, National figure, and uh, he is a professor of uh, hematology, professor of hematology and bone marrow transplantation. He is also uh, a HTC fellow and also the bone marrow transplantation fellow. Uh, she nicely uh, delivered his lectures, and especially uh, focusing the comparable study of the first line, second line, third line, fourth line of uh, uh, yeah, TKI. And uh, another uh, speaker is from uh, uh, India. Uh, India is our big brother. But uh, I think uh, Professor Vikram Mithus is our great friend. Uh, because Vikram Mithus uh, came here uh, for first time to our country and uh, he, he did not uh, to our society when we call, he will uh, attend with us. 
and he is also uh, it is needless to say that uh, uh, professor vikram mathur uh, is a national and international figure uh, in, uh, in in his country his he is a reputed figure in uh, all over the asian country because uh, we we think that they, uh, uh, we have from when we uh, transfer a patient to other country for better management first thing we uh, think is the uh, cm uh, yeah cmc valor and uh, where there is a uh, vikram mathus is there so uh, he has a lots of experience about bone marrow transplantation hematology uh, and also uh, uh, hemophilia so i would like to give a big thanks to uh, our speaker uh, professor vikram mathus uh another uh, our uh, question and answer session is very much interesting and uh, uh, all the panel of experts are uh, communicate and uh, communicate and uh, uh, communicate to uh, our uh, uh, speakers and so i would like to give thanks to our panelists uh, professor akm kamrud jaman professor shirazul islam and professor uh, amin lutful kobir uh overall uh, i am very much impressed uh today's webinar because it is very much interactive the question and answer session is nicely uh, uh, nicely organized by our uh, moderator dr humaira nazmin uh, so before to uh, uh, time is over and here uh, and now it is about uh, to so before my concluding the speech uh, i hope Uh, all the participants for good health and uh, good life to all the participants of our hematologists and hematology family uh, good luck and good health for all of them uh um, uh, now i will conclude uh, my session thanks for all thanks to everybody sabai bhalo thaken धन्यवाद